In today's show, the Pelicans make the playoffs. And the Blazers lose their shot at a second lottery pick in the 2022 draft. It's not looking so good. Uh oh. Let's talk about it. Welcome to Locked On Blazers. You are Locked On Trail Blazers, your daily Portland Trail Blazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trail Blazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You are listening to another episode of Locked on Blazers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making Locked on Blazers your first listen every day, free on all platforms, available wherever you get podcasts. Make it a part of your daily routine. Listen to it every single day. And then tell your friends to do the same. And if if you're committed to listening now, you either... Little, want a little Blazer Freud, or you're a true fan, so I truly appreciate it because it was a bad weekend for your Portland Trail Blazers. No way to spin it. No way to spin it. No way to spin it. The Blazers, the most important game of the Blazers season was Friday night when the New Orleans Pelicans played the Los Angeles Clippers in Los Angeles to see who gets the eighth and final playoff spot in the Western Conference, and it went the wrong way for the Blazers. It just straight up went the wrong way. Pelicans win. They make the playoffs. Blazers lose their lottery pick and are going to have to settle for a 2025 pick from the Milwaukee Bucks to complete that CJ McCollum trade. There's a lot going on there. And folks are mad, uh, both anecdotally and like specifically in my inbox. People are mad at the Blazers. Let's talk about that Pelicans game. Talk about the clip, their matchup with the Clippers. We'll do a little, a little recap of that Friday night game, a, a really competitive, entertaining game. And then we'll, we'll we'll kind of look at, at where the Blazers are at. We'll talk about Joe Cronin. He's getting a, a, Folks are pointing a lot of fingers and a lot of pitchforks at him. We'll talk about the sort of legitimacy of that. But let's start with the game stuff. The New Orleans Pelicans win 105-101 in Friday night, on Friday nights in the Crypt, at the Crypt, against the Clippers in Los Angeles. A road win. The Pelicans uh, you know, win in New Orleans to advance and then win on the road. It was always going to take two wins in the play-in for them to get in. Always the case. And here we are now. That's, they did it. How did they get there? Well, it started early at 9.17 a.m. on Friday morning. The Los Angeles Clippers officially announced... Paul George had entered the league's health and safety protocols and would miss Friday's game. Yikes. Uh, according to Lawrence Frank, uh, one of the members of the Clippers front office, basically Paul George was just feeling really bad and they tested him because he was like clearly sick. The way NBA testing works now is like you have to be pretty clearly symptomatic to be tested. Um, it's not daily testing the way it was, particularly for those of um, those players on the team that are uh, fully vaccinated, which George is. And... That's that's how it ended. Uh, George tested positive or at least entered health and safety protocols. They don't actually t- give us the information there and missed the game. Prior to George's injury, the the Clippers were four point favorites at home, according to BetOnline.net. They slipped to minus one and a half by tip off. So Paul George's absence, a five and a half point swing in favor of the Pelicans, and they won by four. Clippers cover. Let's or uh, they won by four. Uh, so that's it's about right. Clippers didn't cover. I got my math wrong. Real quick. Let's 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 look into how this happened. Pels led by many as sixteen in the second quarter. This game looks like it was out of hand. Um, the the the. Uh, Clippers just didn't, they were missing their big guns, missing some of their firepower. They've kind of been a mediocre team without Paul George, and they looked kind of like a mediocre team. They're down 16 in the second quarter, but a late flurry cut it to 10 at halftime. They're down 56-46 going in the break. Brandon Ingram was hot early, finished with, or had 18 points in the first half. And Larry Nance, of course, all these former Blazers involved in this one. Larry Nance had 10 and 9 at the break. Uh, Clippers, though, ripped off a 38-18 third quarter to go from down 10 to up 10 in control of this game heading into the fourth quarter. But the Pels, in the first four minutes, four and a half minutes of the the fourth quarter, took a 14, went on a 14-4 run. The game is tied. There's seven and a half minutes left, and it's on. Like, there was no comfort anymore. It was going to come down to who could do it. And 
the the Clippers just left left some stuff on the table. The Pels didn't actually take their first lead of of the second half until uh, there was four minutes left in the game. So they tied it with like seven and a half minutes left, and there was three minutes back and forth. Uh, Clippers still, you know, with a one point, two point, and three point as many as three point leads up by like a bucket uh, on three separate occasions. But Pels finally take a lead with four minutes left when Larry Nance tips in a tips in a missed shot. Uh, Nance was great in this game, just straight up great. Uh, CJ McCollum then comes down after uh, after a Mar- Marcus Morris miss. CJ McCollum hits a base line jumper CJ was not good in this game and then Reggie Jackson misses a, a kind of a tough shot in the lane and, and rookie Trey Murphy buries a three-pointer to put the Pelicans up seven with two minutes and one second left and it felt like it was over right like it felt like okay you can, you're now down 17 in the second in, in um in this quarter like you're just you're getting rolled from up 10 starting the fourth two down seven with two minutes left you blew up you know you're getting outscored by 17 points in 10 minutes it's over and even then even then somehow the Clippers still had a chance in this game uh with 26.6 seconds left and the Pels up by four Reggie Jackson steps to the free throw line and splits a pair of free throws damn it and this was going to be a theme for the Clippers they were going to miss a bunch of free throws but the the Pelicans returned the fla- returned the flavor they returned the favor too um Clippers get foul Larry Nance when he gets the ball near midcourt he's the one they quickly foul let's go ahead and put him on the line Larry Nance steps the line and clangs two free throws so you know it was a after Reggie Jackson hits those free throws, they're down three, and like, well, damn, that's going to be it. And the Pels leave the door open. The, the Clippers get the ball back with, you know, under 20 seconds left, down three. And in a scramble on the wing, Norman Powell draws a foul and gets to go to the free throw line. Uh, it's probably too early to intentionally foul, but not the worst with the with the Clippers, um, you know, l- low on timeouts, out of timeouts, and... Um, and and needing a three pointer and Norman Powell's chance to go to the free throw line, make it a two point game, still with 17 seconds left, and or make it a one point game if he hits both. Make it 17 seconds left. You can play the foul game. You can get into it. All of those things. The Pelicans, you know, both teams are clanging free throws. Both teams shoot under 70 percent from the free throw line in this game, and Norm short arms the first one, just so short off the front rim. Norm, you needed to do your former team a solid, and you missed one. Oh man, makes the second one. St- you know, still just a two point game and, and the Clippers don't foul, which I really like. They don't foul right away. They almost get a, a get a trap and a steal. Uh, Brandon Ingram gets the ball in the corner. They trap him. He throws a crazy lob to Herb Jones. Robert Covington almost knocks the ball away in a steal, but the ball gets out of bounds. Former Blazers all over this bad boy. He's a Blazers alumni game straight up. Uh, clip, you know, Pelicans get the ball back after that scramble. And again, the Clippers don't try to foul right away. You know, they're, they're, they're still down two, and, and a, a foul's going to kind of put them in a tough spot with no timeouts left. And Brandon Ingram steps through a double team. They almost got him, but he stepped through a double team, finds Jonas Valanciunas under the rim. He gets a dunk. Clippers go the other way, force up two, two three-pointers, miss them both, and that's your ball game. And that sends the Blazers out of the lottery, out of the chance to get a lottery pick. The Pelicans had to miss the playoffs. Otherwise, that pick conveys to uh, to the Hornets for, to complete the Devontae Graham deal. Congrats to the Hornets. They're getting the pick, and the Blazers end up with a 2025 pick from the Bucks. Not only is this worse, right? Like, not only is this worse because it's the Bucks are probably going to still be pretty good in 2025. Like, Chris Middleton's going to be older. Drew, Drew Holiday's going to probably not be, not be around. Same with, like, Brooke Lopez. They're going to change, but... I just want to wager like a team with Giannis Antetokounmpo is going to be really good even in three years, long time from now. But even if they're not a long time from now, just the timeline of Damian Lillard on this roster, a 2025 pick is just way less valuable to what the Blazers want to do. So much of their plan this summer hinged on getting this lottery pick and they didn't get it. That's what we're talking about uh, to, to end the show. But like real quick, CJ McCollum went nine for 24 in this game. The the, the Clippers got a freaking CJ McCollum 15 missed shot special, special one of seven from three. Like, they got what they needed, right? Jonas Valanciunas got played off the floor because the Clippers went small to open the second half and just absolutely turned up the pressure. Their, their, their defensive intensity with all smalls and putting Covington in at center, um, all you know, getting rid of, you know, getting rid of the, the traditional center lineups with Zubac, like, it almost freaking worked. It almost worked. They were up 10. They just, they needed a little more. Marcus Morris was really good early, but but missed shots late. Uh, you know, Reggie Jackson, had, each of them finished with 27, but, but they needed... Either one of those guys to make buckets down the stretch. Uh, they scored just 17 points in the fourth quarter after a 38 point third. Uh, the credit to the Pelicans, they turned it back up. Uh, they went back to Valentunas to kind of counter the small ball and give uh, to win the boards. They they did. W- I don't know if they won like second chance points necessarily, but they really did. Um, 
They really did control the glass, gave themselves some gave themselves some opportunities. Larry Nance Jr. was great in this game. 14 points, 16 rebounds. He helped he helped the Pelicans go small. It's almost like the guy the Blazers traded for to be like a potential small ball center in a playoff setting was a really good small ball center. Too bad that uh the Blazers just could never really figure it out with Larry. It just he just never really never they never got to a high leverage game where this version of Larry Nance would matter. And the guy who really won the game for the Pelicans was Trey Murphy. Um hilariously in the first in the in the uh, yeah, in the in the third quarter when like things were getting a little dicey, uh, Willie Green turned to Tony Snell to be that sort of like floor spacing other wing like, in a small lineup, and Snell was horrific. He played four minutes and they were outscored by nine points. And so then it like the light goes on in the, in the second half, late in the second half for for Willie Green. He puts in Trey Murphy and he plays twenty four minutes and hits four threes, including three in the final quarter. He was just crucial. He was great. Uh, finished with fourteen points, five boards, and two assists. He was plus twenty six in twenty four minutes. Uh, Willie Willie Green. Um, I thought got outcoached and then made the adjustments when as soon as Nicholas Batum went off the floor, who was really hounding Brandon Ingram, he made sure to get some some Ingram minutes without Batum on the floor. That was crucial. Helped change the game. B.I. was great. Finished with 30 in this one. And that's it. And that's all. Uh, you know, go listen to Locked on Pels or, or, or Locked on Clippers for more on this game. But like this was this sucked. This sucked. Uh, I had a friend text me. He lives in the East Coast. Uh, he's I'll, I'll shout him out. My friend Chuck of uh, Charles Tuggle, former guest in this podcast and a longtime friend of mine, uh, one of the best friends in the world, said, I fell asleep and woke up to a Pell's win. This stinks. It does stink. Let's talk about how much it stinks in the second segment because folks are mad and you have right to be mad and frustrated. And I want I want to hear you. But I also want to like push towards a little bit more logic in your outrage. I'm, I'm pro outrage, but I'm also pro logic. We'll talk about that in the second segment. Before we do that, I want to tell you about AG1. It's a product I literally started my day with this morning. Um, I use AG1 because I was interested in having a daily routine that would kind of help my immune system, give me a little more energy, and help my gut health in general. You might be asking, what is AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop, Throw it in some, I put it in my water in the morning and with one delicious scoop of AG1, I'm absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, source superfoods, probiotics and adaptogens. And they help me start my day right. And it's a special blend that supports gut health, nervous system, immune system, energy, re- recovery, focus, all of the things. Um, listen, it's... It supports better sleep. It supports recovery, supports mental clarity and alertness. It's one thing with, it's just one thing with all of the best things. Athletic Greens uses the best of the best products based on the latest science with constant product iterations and third party testing. It's it's a small micro habit with big benefits. It's one thing you can do every single day to take care of yourself. So right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. One scoop and a cup of water a day, that's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. And all you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NBA network. Again, athleticgreens.com slash NBA network to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Today's show is also brought to you by Built.com. Com, not build.com, Bill Bar. I'm I'm screwing up my ad for a product I genuinely love and have been advertising for years. Um, I have Bill Bars in my pantry upstairs right now because they're the best tasting protein bar on the market. That's what they're doing. The average Bill Bar, 17 grams of protein, 130 calories, four grams of sugar, and just four net carbs. They're packing a punch and they're healthy, plus amazing flavors. Uh, upstairs right now, peanut butter brownie, but if you're not into peanut butter brownie, you can find all types of flavors like salted caramel, double chocolate, you can find raspberry, you can find coconut almond, and when it's around, make sure you get it. Coconut brownie puff, the absolute number one favorite across the board for all the Locked On hosts. So uh, that's a limited time flavor that makes some appearances. If it makes an appearance, I suggest you go get yourself some to do that, you go to built.com and you use the promo code LOCKED15, you'll get 15% off your next order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. All right. So, you're mad. Maybe not you necessarily, but your friends are pissed. Uh, anecdotally, like just reading the Twitter timeline on Friday night, Blazer fans were mad. They were mad. Uh, and I. I 
this was a frustrating season, and this end was a frustrating end to that season. The Bla this was the most important Blazer game of the Blazers season, and they were spectators, and then it ended by the team you wanted to win blowing a 10-point lead in the fourth quarter, and your former friends either winning it in the case of Larry Nash Jr. or blowing it in the case of, of guys like Norman Powell. Like, that sucked. That sucked. And I do not want to slow down your rage if you're if you're saying, like, this stinks, I'm mad, this team let me down. They did. They were supposed to be good, and they weren't. And then they really super-duper pulled the plug and were the worst team in the NBA and finished the season winning two of 23 games and, like, actively losing. They have given you a bad taste in your mouth, followed by a bad taste in your mouth, followed by a bad taste in your mouth. There's not a lot of, not a lot of palate cleansers in here for the Blazers' season. And it ended with this stinker. You deserve and are right to be mad. However, I think some of the, the sort of logic around all of this is a little bit flawed. Like, let's be clear. The Blazers not getting a draft pick is worse. This is the worst. This is, of the possible scenarios, this was the worst one, right? Like, this was as this was going to be the worst news. Because it's not like um, they didn't get a protected pick and, and, and like, have a chance and, and, you know, lose the lottery and you know, Pels finished top four or whatever, and then you have to have to wait. It wasn't just like lottery balls. It was just like you watched a team melt down and lose for you. And the and because of that, the Blazers are in a worse situation. But what I have seen, and what I want to push back a little get against with logic, is that the outcome of this game somehow is proof that Joe Cronin needs to be fired or isn't capable of leading a team. And I just disagree with that. I don't want to defend Cronin here. In fact, for the rest of the show, I want to sort of unpack Cronin's moves and where he goes from here as the as the leader of this team. But the idea that what happened on Friday night was proof that Cronin needs to be fired is the stupidest way to think about it. And let me be clear why I think that is stupid. I think you're right to be mad. But what when Cronin took a risk, he did so in February. He did so in February knowing the exact things. The Pelicans at the time were on the edge of the play-in game, very likely to make the play-in because they were going to get C.J. McCollum, but have to win two games to get there. One of those games was supposed to be against the Los Angeles Lakers, but they freaking crumbled. Is that is that Joe Cronin's fault? I don't really think so. I don't think so. I don't think he was involved in the Lakers being super bad. Um, then, on Friday morning, at 9 a.m., on Friday morning, when Paul George was exposed to the novel coronavirus, that wasn't his fault either. That had nothing to do with Joe Cronin, just straight up nothing to do with him. Those are the results you should be mad at the process. If you are frustrated with Cronin, you need to be frustrated with the process that he undertook in February by trading CJ McCollum for this lottery pick. If you were mad then, great. But if you changed your opinion on the outcome of this game or the exposure to a virus by a player on another team, you are doing it wrong and you're using results to paint your idea of the process. The process has not changed since February. The results change. This was always the risk. This was always the risk. Uh, this this is, it, like I said, it's made worse by the tanking, right? All of this is made worse by how, how poorly the season went and then how aggressively they lost. You just haven't seen an enjoyable Blazer game in a year, right? Like, <laughs> like basically since they shut Ant down, they haven't played an enjoyable Blazer game. I guess we have seen an enjoyable Blazer game. February 16th, 2022, the Blazers beat the Memphis Grizzlies to head into the All-Star break on a four-game winning streak, and the team decided that was enough, and they didn't need to see any more. That I I have said a bunch of times in this podcast that I I thought tanking sucks like it doesn't it's not enjoyable even if it's the right strategy but it sucks and I think this is the same thing like this was this was a a calculated risk by Cronin right I am going to trade C J McCollum. I do not want to take back long-term salary and I'm trying to get a first round draft pick because I want to improve our odds or have ammo to trade, but I do, but no, no long-term salary. So you get Josh Hart back, pretty good player. Like Josh Hart's pretty good. Um, in terms of like when we were, we've done this a bunch on the show. Like if, if you're a new listener, maybe you don't know this, but like long time listeners, like we did like how, how will the Blazers trade CJ McCollum? And we just kept unpacking like, man, it's going to be hard. Like they're just, you know, he's making $30 million. You're going to have to find the right team. You're going to have to, and the Pelicans are like the perfect team, right? He fits really well there. Um, they wanted to make the playoffs this year. Not, I don't know how many teams in the league uh, really wanted to be the eighth seed in the playoffs. Like that's that that's that takes a special finder, or like wanted to push and be a low seed in the playoffs, and thought CJ would be that guy who pushes them there. 
he didn't really fit, he doesn't really fit on contenders because he doesn't push contenders higher. So it's like a medi- take a mediocre team and make them better. That's like kind of the level of player that CJ McCollum is, and he certainly did that. He was really good, even if he went nine for twenty four in the elimination game. Uh, like the Blazers found a partner. They found a partner that worked. They found a partner where they didn't have the only onerous contract they had to take back was Didi Luzadas, who's making like under two million dollars next season. Like they didn't they didn't have to take back bad money. They didn't have to give they didn't have to attach a draft pick to just kind of get out from under CJ McCollum. What they had to attach was pretty decent player Larry Nance Jr., which feels like a worse trade. And then they they took this risk, right? And if you thought this was a bad risk at the time, sure, go for it. Um, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to show me your receipts, but like, I think we all thought, or at least I said here, and I think I, I didn't get much pushback, so I, I'm going to just anecdotally say that many of you agreed that it was a little bit underwhelming haul for CJ, but it wasn't bad. In fact, I look back at that trade and say it's kind of fine. It's kind of fine. For all things considered, the CJ deal of the whole of the Cronin enterprise has been fine. That's like, that That was a pretty good not even good, fine. It was a pretty reasonable trade for what they had to trade and what they wanted to get back. And it didn't work out. And it's worse for them. They're in a worse place. Like they're screwed in some ways because of it. This was tra- This pick was basically earmarked for Jeremy Grant. It's a little bit weird that we knew exactly what that pick was going to be traded for, but shout out to Shams Tarania for the intrepid reporting. Um, it's worse. It's worse. The Blazers are in a worse spot, and Friday was a bad night. But the idea that the results are the thing that should get Cronin fired and not the process is a stupid way to look at it. It's just straight up dumb. Like, I don't want to call, I think, like, yelling into a microphone that the people who listen to your show are stupid is, like, not something I want to do. That's, that's not my brand. But I just think the logic behind it is messed up. If you were on board until Paul George got put in the health and safety protocols you can't jump ship then because that's you're you're just you're just prioritizing this the results over the process you need to be mad at the process and quite frankly i want to talk about that process because the part of the process that seems broken is not the cj mccollum trade it's the norman powell and robert covington trade let's talk about that and then talk about how the blazers can move forward to uh to end the show because i think there's reason to be upset there's reason to say that cronin hasn't done as as good as he as good as he could have or as good as you might have hoped um but I think it has more to do with the other trades than specifically the trade that was finalized or, or or cemented on Friday evening. So let's do that before we get there. I'll tell you about betonline.net, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. More lines, more props, more odds than anywhere else. You want to bet on the NBA playoffs? They're rolling along. I'm actually recording this during the uh, the. Uh, Sunday first round game Celtics uh, Celtics Nets is on my TV right here you can't see it but I'm watching it right now the corner of my eye um, so you'll get all those games uh, as I'm recording this two more games and then all the game twos next week and then we'll head into game threes and all of that if you don't want to bet in the NBA you'll find all of the other sports for you and like I said all of those not just NBA but lines and props and odds on everything live betting whatever you want so go take advantage go to betonline.net right now let's bet online where the games start Still a pass first point guard. Still Mike Richmond. You are still listening to Locked on Blazers. And we're still mad. Still mad at Joe Cronin. And there is reason to be mad at that gentleman. For sure. But I think it's a little misplaced. And that's why I want to talk about in that second segment. Is like I think the results of the CJ McCollum trade made it feel like the process was bad. And I don't think the CJ McCollum process was bad. But I do think the Norman Powell Robert Covington process was bad. Let me walk you through that and why I think that is the trade that I'm more like, wait, what the hell? (laughs) That happened before the deadline. That was the, uh, the deadline was the, the, like the following Thursday. And that trade happened a week ahead on a Friday. It seems a little bit wild at the time. And what the Blazers were getting out of it was out from under uh, Norman Powell's money. That's basically, you can look at it as trading for Amferty Simons by doing that. It's like, we got to get rid of Norman Powell's money because we're going to pay uh, Ant a bunch of money and they play the same position. Let's let's not repeat the exact same thing as the CJ Norm Dame thing. Let's make it a little bit different, right? That's You could say that's okay. But they didn't get a vet back who can help. Like, Justice Winslow is going to be fine, but he's not an NBA starter. In fact, like, I think he's a fringe bench guy. Like, he's, I think he can contribute on a pretty competitive team. And when the Blazers were at their best for literally four games for one week, Justice Winslow was a pretty big part of those four games over one week. It's also four games over one week. Did I mention that it was four good games over one week? I just, like, I'm not a, 
I don't think Justice Winslow, I don't think a straight up norm for Justice Winslow trade looks good for anybody. The Blazers didn't really get back useful draft capital. You know, they get back like a second round pick from the from the uh, Detroit Pistons in exchange for it. They need to replenish their second round picks, but that's not meaningful. I thought how this was going to go into the trade deadline. The Blazers were going to try to trade for veterans, right? Like for veterans who could help. And I thought Norman Powell would have more value than getting back the you know partially guaranteed contract of Eric Bledsoe and Justice Winslow and whatever Keon Johnson turns into. If you're super high on Keon Johnson, maybe you don't see that trade blossoming like as a problem. But I don't really. Well, I think Keon might turn into a player. Like he's a really good athlete and stuff. Like I think he's a couple years away from being like a really impactful player. The Blazers needed either like someone with tremendous upside, which I don't see Keon as having tremendous upside, although he has some upside for sure, um, or someone who could help right away. They got neither. They got neither. They got Justice Winslow who can't shoot, um, who's like a weird fit next to two guys who are going to be on the ball a bunch, and Anthony Simons and um, and Damian Lillard. Maybe you can mitigate some of that with how like the speed they're going to play. Maybe his defense offsets some of the lack of shooting, but he doesn't seem like a great fit, and never is he going to seem like a starter in the league on a really good team. He's a he is a fringe rotation guy on a good team. Can he be part of your rotation if you're a good team? Absolutely. Is he guaranteed to be the part of the rotation of every good team? No, no, absolutely not. He's it is what it is. He's like a a, a borderline rotation player on a competitive basketball team. The Blazers fancy themselves a competitive basketball team. I think you can play Justice Winslow a bunch of minutes, but he's not he's not a, like he's not the part that pushes you over the top and sort of changes the game. That's just not what this is at all in any in any way, shape, or form. Um, and Robert Covington, you would have liked to get him for a second round pick. Um, Maybe you'd have to take back some bad money and they didn't want to do that. But the Blazers prioritizing clean books in the future to get back almost nothing of, you know, to get back Justice Winslow for two guys who were part of the rotation. It just stinks. It stinks. That was a bad trade. I find that trade to be much less defendable than the CJ trade. I find the CJ trade to be relatively like you can just see the logic and it's like seems straightforward. That's how that was going to play out. The Norman Rocco trade does not does not pass the smell test for me. I would be much more mad about that one. And so then I see when you take it as a whole, like say you're less positive than I am on the CJ trade, totally fine. Um, we might disagree, but I think it's healthy to disagree. And you're equally negative on the Norman Rocco trade. Yeah, yeah, you've got your pitchfork out and you're ready to get rid of this ball dude, this big 6'6 six, six ball dude who's in charge of the Blazers. Sure, sure. I, I don't want to stop your rage. Uh, I wanted to sort of redirect it towards a more logical use of the rage, but I don't want to stop your rage. If you're pissed, you're pissed and you deserve to be mad. Like it's fine there. This was a bad season and this was a really bad ending to the bad season. So now the question is how the hell do they get out of this, Mike? And the simple answer is they had really thin margins to get this right. And those margins got really thinner, but much thinner, really thinner. It's not what I was trying to say. They got much thinner. So if it had all worked out, right? The Blazers, uh, you know, jump up in the draft. They pick third and they pick third in the draft. Bing, bang, boom. The Pelicans pick is 11th. They trade that 11th pick and their traded player exception for, I don't know, Jeremy Grant, the name that it seemed to be earmarked for all the time. And then you could argue that you'd rather them pick 11th than trade for Grant. But let's just, let's follow me on the logic here. So now you've picked like uh, Paolo Bencaro and you've got Jeremy Grant. You've now got two like reasonable power forwards to 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 fill out your front line, you sign a center with your with um, some of your mid level money. You get like a real reasonable backup center. You you add you know one other guard. You kind of split that mid level money to get a reasonable backup center and another guard to kind of bolster your front backcourt rotation. Now you've got a team. Like now you got a squad. Um, is that team going to win the championship? No. No, but they could be really competitive. Like they, that would have, they would have kind of morphed into a pretty darn good team in the West. Uh, like right in that range of, I think two through six in the West is pretty even. And I think the Blazers with that summer would have jumped up into that two through six range. Uh, you know, puncher's chance to make the Western Conference Finals, right? They don't have that path anymore. That's out the door. So now... I don't think you can trade your lottery pick. If the Blazers, even if it doesn't move anywhere, if the Blazers finish, get the seventh pick in the draft, I think you need to pick a rookie and have that rookie be a contributor. Because trading for a vet with the Blazers' salary situation such that it's going to be if they pay Ant and pay Nurk and extend Dame, they just need guys who can contribute on rookie scale contracts. And they don't really have that right now, unless you're a big believer in Keon Johnson and Greg Brown, and I'm not. 
Nazir Little's the last year of his rookie scale deal. He's going to need some money. Um, it's you know other guy you know the rest of the rotation of like players who contribute are vets. Josh Hart and Justice Winslow are vets. So like you just you need cheaper parts. So you're going to need that rookie to contribute. Also like you just need the upside of having a 22 year old on the roster. You need you need a a game changer bridge to what's next type of player. You absolutely I think I think you just have to pick seventh um, with your seventh pick. And now. You have this 2025 pick from the Bucks and the traded player exception. Is that enough to get Jeremy Grant? Probably hell no. Probably like a capital H, hell no. Um, shout out to <laughs> shout out to longtime listeners who remember the hell no drops uh, back before copyright issues made me made me get rid of those. Um, I don't think you can land a a Jeremy Grant level player, and I think a lot of you do not like Jeremy Grant. That's fine. That's that's a conversation for another day. But a Jeremy Grant level player, say a high end role player. Let's let's not let's put less proper nouns on it and more like just like the vagaries of it. I don't think you're just getting a high end role player, unless and I, this was pointed out to me by listener Doctor J. Other teams who are trying to clear salary to make moves need to drop someone in your lap. That's where the Blazers are going to have to pivot to, as opposed to having this first round pick TPE trade package that you can kind of uh, move around. And the, the TPE allows you to absorb someone making under $21 million. So and, and as opposed to having that, like that sort of route, now you have the like, hey, we are the the uh, whatever Orlando Magic and we're trying to make a we're trying to make moves. What can we fit Jonathan Isaac into this trade player exception or same with the Kings or same with, you know, some version of the Lakers, although they don't really have anyone that fits that necessarily. But like a team looking to clear salary to make a trade might more might value the TPE just because it straight up gets gets rid of that money for them. Like um, the most recent uses of the trade player exception that that I'm aware of are, are the Celtics getting uh, Evan Fournier and then Josh Richardson actually in reverse. Josh Richardson and then Evan Fournier absorbing them into the trade player exception they had for for dumping uh, Gordon Hayward. That um, that is kind of the level of player you're looking at, right? Are Josh Richardson and Evan Fournier good? Not game changing good, but they're like decent rotation players. So the Blazers, I think, have stepped a tier down. So the, like now we're talking about threading the needle. Got to nail the draft pick. Then you got to get this like tier down role player that helps. So you got to like really identify who can help and what that player looks like and it fitting into Chauncey's system, which seems to be, I don't know. Let's That's for another day. You need a player that fits. You need a player that fits. So I think the they're in a worse spot. And I think you have every right to be frustrated, disappointed, and all those things with the way Cronin has done things. I think maybe the results co covered up the process more than they should have, but I think you have every right to be frustrated, and I don't want to deny you or tell you that you're wrong in that frustration. I think it's real. Uh, to quote a friend who, who, said, who uh, was watching the game on Friday, said, this sucks, Mike. Indeed it does, Andrew. Indeed it does. Uh, it's... I think their path out is just before they had a couple chances to hopefully get it right. And if they got, you know, three out of the four avenues right, they'd have a chance to be competitive. Now they basically have two, two shots at this to get it right. Like they got to get the TPE trade correct and they got to get their draft pick correct. And if they don't do that, they're probably not going to be very good. And I think that's just the reality of it. The Pelicans win ruined the offseason plan. I think the risk was probably still worth it, but the overall body of work with what the Blazers have pivoted from has put them in a tough spot. And I'll say this to close the show. The previous regime was doomed by inaction. They weren't willing to trade CJ McCollum. They weren't willing to take big risks because if you take a big risk and you do you try to dramatically shift the direction of the franchise in a short period of time, there's a chance it fails. I think it kind of failed. But this was the thing so many were screaming for with Neil Olshay. Take a risk, coward. And not because it's guaranteed to work, but because taking a risk is the only path the Blazers had out of their sort of cycle of mediocrity. Now they look like they might still be stuck in it. But the easy thing to do is run it back and be okay with being mediocre. That's the easy thing to do. The Blazers took a swing. They, str they struck out. But you can't 
You can't just take a bunch of pitches. The Blazers have spent years saying, okay, minor, we'll, we'll ship out uh, first-round picks for draft picks because we like our core and we're never going to take a big risk with any of our veteran players. They took real risks. I don't really love what they did with Norman Powell. I, I don't really have much of a problem with what they did with C.J. McCollum, but the real risks they took led them here. Those of you screaming for the previous regime to do something, to take action, to take a risk, you got it and you got one of the downsides of taking a risk and you see why maybe the previous people in charge didn't want to go this route. When you take a risk, there's a chance it blows up. It blew up. And here they are with a difficult path forward. So for the rest of the offseason and for the rest of this week, let's talk about that path forward. Let's shift to talking about draft stuff. Let's shift to talking about free agent approaches, all of those things. Because what's next for the Blazers became, it was already a crucially important summer. And now it's a crucially important summer with an even tighter needle to thread. So guess what? Lockdown Blazers will be here to help us figure out Help you figure out, help me as I figure out with you. Like I'm thinking along right with y'all. I spend a lot of time thinking about this team, trying to make it easy for you to digest. We're going to do this together. What the hell's next? Because it got harder on Friday. And it's kind of a bummer. Legitimately a bummer. Not kind of, legitimately a bummer. Let's, let's call it what it is. I don't need to couch it. So stick with me. We got more shows this week, five days a week, available wherever you get podcasts. The only Daily Trailblazers podcast. Uh, just search Lockdown Blazers wherever you're looking for us. You'll find us. Tell your friends to do the same. Appreciate you listening. Talk to you soon.